Uh, my name is Ben. Oh, I can get to that. Before I go too deep, um, thank you all for coming. It's pretty cool to see this many people. Uh, can I have a show of hands? How many of you have given a presentation to you, to this many people before? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you guys can all come up to me afterwards and tell me Okay, so, um, <laughs> so my name is Ben. Uh, I don't have as much Django experience as a lot of people I heard. I have more than some. Uh, I spent the last year and a half working with Inside Squared, uh, working on their Django app, which is a small, medium business analytics app, uh, analytics on CRM systems. And um, here's where my logo bond, they're intentionally all together because I don't really want to talk about it a lot, but uh, Inside Squared, is in a large way the impetus for this talk. It's where I, all my Django experience pretty much has come from, and it's where I did the work that taught me these things. And uh, I'm not working there anymore, but they're a great company, and if you'd like an introduction to them, just let me know. This is my agenda. Uh, sorry, this is my agenda. Uh, these things are all going to fall into different categories. Some of them are no doubt obvious to anyone who's read through documentation for an hour. Some of them are sort of oh, okay, that makes sense. And um, maybe one or two things are holy moly. Uh, if I doesn't seem like I said anything in the holy moly category, it just didn't get to it. So you know, it's, it's going to be your own judgment on what's in what category. Uh, so the setup I'm talking about: very old Python, Django 1.6. My SQL uh, 5.6, I run a Mac. I built an app for a little of, of this uh, talk. I needed something that I could use to run some simulations. Uh, it's called YA Linux, yet another analytics platform. This is your, your diagram. It's pretty simple. Uh, I also built some test data sets. I based them off of the number of leads. So this is a system that has leads. Leads can belong to many different campaigns. Uh, they get converted to opportunities. Opportunities go through stages. Stages are one as deals by employees. Does that make sense? Need something to not make numbers out of thin air for you. I'm sure you've so many of you have heard this quote. Um, you can't really even talk about uh, profiling and optimization and performance tuning without recognizing that the first step is always to figure out what you need to be doing. Uh, so you need to know if you actually have a query set problem or not. Profiling tools that I've used, uh, the top three in particular, AppNeta looks awesome, by the way. Um, it actually really does. It looks like there's some things that I've used New Relic historically, but AppNeta looks like it does some things that New Relic doesn't do quite as well. Uh, Django Debug Toolbar, people used that before? Yeah, no, it's good. Um, first line of defense, right? You develop a sign, sign feels slow, what the heck's going on? How many queries do I have? Uh, how slow are they? Got some screenshots. Um, Repose is a little lower level. It will show you every function call through the, the Django and Python layer, how long it took um, in cumulative, how long it took an average, I think. Uh, but it's not very user friendly. Hotshot actually looks like a better version of Repose. Uh, Django Lite Profile looks good. Django Snippet Screen definitely wins my best name award. And you can't really do anything without having my SQL at your fingertips. So, just briefly, New Relic. Finding out what's going on in production or AppNeta, finding out what's going on, tracing it back to something that you can reproduce on your dev box. <coughs> Take the web toolbar, gain a sense of what's going on on your dev box as you're developing, and repose uh, more data than you can shake a stick at, but sometimes you can find something that really uh, makes sense. So we're going to assume, yes, I have a query set problem, and we're going to talk about that. So with any query, your enemies are data size and complexity. Uh, when I say query, maybe a single query, maybe multiple queries uh, run over and over. Uh, some basic techniques, 
very simple stuff. Don't load objects you don't need. So for instance, if you uh, have an opportunity object and you want to get the lead ID, you already have it. You don't need to load the, lead, the whole lead and then get the ID off that object. Simple practice. Um, don't load fields you don't need. You can select uh, only certain fields to be populated and that can, uh, in large situations, reduce the amount of data. I don't know if it applies to some of these things, but if you can identify what's Django 1.6 for those of us who aren't using it. I honestly can't. But um, I have actually done most of my development on Django 1.5, and I haven't noticed anything. I just, when I, this is a new machine, when I pip installed, it just did 1.6, and I said, okay, what's wrong with that? I didn't think about it. And I haven't, I haven't seen anything uh, that would impact this topic. Uh, someone's going to tell me that only is, in, is new in 1.6, right? Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, and then load specific data, not entire objects. I don't necessarily say do any of these things all the time. Do them when you feel like they might be necessary when you're loading a lot of data. Uh, but you have these things available to you. You don't have to load the objects completely. You can load the values as dictionary. You can load values as, as lists. All right, so the first question that you might ask in, in the system in gate Linux, how many leads do I have? Do I have any at all? This actually uh, bit quite a number, number of, uh, of reports at Inside Square. So very Pythonic. You want to know you had a query set. It might not be lead that object at all. It might be something that's got a bunch of filters applied to it before you even get it at this level of the application. Is there anything there? How many are there? Uh, turns out this can be really bad, and Django documentation says so pretty clearly. Uh, it does not look at, so you can you know, override the len uh, function and say what it should do on a particular, specific model, but the query set doesn't do that in any sort of way that you might hope or might want it to. It might not, right? But it doesn't uh, convert that into a select count star. It just loads all the data, does the list, the length of that list. So that's something you should avoid, uh, unless you mean to. <coughs> and save with pool. Right, you just want to uh, evaluate it. There we go. So I did a little data, as I said. So fairly typical. The data size is going up 1K, 10K, 100K, 1 million. You're seeing a typical, you know, proportionate increase in runtime. Those are in milliseconds. But you dot exists, your dot count, stay linear. So don't treat query sets like lists. Query sets have a lot of functionality. And what they really do is they expose functionality that the databases have. And I'd say one of the themes that I learned through the performance tuning I was doing was that if you can do it in MySQL, uh, you're going to be pretty well off. Because MySQL has been worked on for a very long time and Postgres and all the SQL systems have been worked on for a very long time to do what they do very well. Python and Django are phenomenal, but they're more general purpose. Uh, I actually saw, this isn't a talk, because it's not query set related per se. I saw someone trying to calculate standard deviation <coughs> in Python, in the Python they wrote. I don't know how many different libraries there are to calculate standard devi deviation, but my, my SQL has one. You should use it. All right, next up, caching. So, you guys can all read this code. It's pretty, pretty large, right? How many queries do you think this uh, is going to send to MySQL? This is not a trick question. Three. Three, yeah. All right, next one. How many queries is this going to send? Notice. Uh, I changed the index. They're all the same index, so it's going to be the same thing over and over. That's your guess? Three. One. Three. Kind of annoying, isn't it? It doesn't actually uh, does not uh, evaluate. So what you're expecting to happen is it evaluates this entire deals query set 
to a list and it evaluates the init time. What it actually does is takes a query set, which is not a list, it determines that what you really want is the first element. So it actually sends that through the SQL as limit zero one. Do you have any idea why they might have designed it like that? Why isn't that just a variable that I, that I can use? Well, couldn't it change well, it, between calls? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it's the opposite of the previous example, right? It's obvious of, ob opposite of this. In, in this situation, you think that they might do something that would not evaluate the query set and would, would sort of translate it to just what you're asking for, but they don't. And then uh, in this circumstance, they do the opposite. You think that they might interpret it, uh, you know, as just evaluate the whole thing, but said they try to do something a little more intelligent. I don't have any explanation. It's just it's what they do. It's good to know if you're worried about this kind of circumstance. I could say I'd be very disappointed if that were the, the functionality of it. Like I, I couldn't like store a query set and then later do things on it. Like it, it just became a list. Like that would be very unexpected. Yeah, and I think. I think one of the biggest takeaways should be know when your query set is a query set and know when you have uh, lazily evaluated to a list. That's a very important step in the, in the life cycle of your query set is when have you actually evaluated this. It's going to wait to the last possible moment to do so. I was going to say for iteration purposes, if you're iterating through it, you don't want to copy that entire thing to like a list because sometimes Absolutely. I mean, I think there's there's lots of reasons why they they wouldn't have done this, right? Um, I think in general, my my programming style is I've done work in Scala that I loved, so I like things to be explicit. I don't love a lot of magic. Um, most of my work has been in Django or Rails, so I'm used to a lot of magic. But uh, mm -hmm. magic is is convenience when magic starts happening and you know the magician doesn't know what's going on, then it becomes dangerous. <laughs> so there's a Spider-Man quote in there somewhere, but. I think, another, <laughs> I think another aspect of that point is the composability of the query set. So you can, you can add expressions to, you can have building blocks of built up query sets and then, um, and then construct them as you need anywhere in the code you want. Absolutely, I mean, you can do some fantastic stuff with the query set algebra that they've written. And uh, I might even, that might even segue to the well, that coming up. Thank you. Um, any other questions before we go on? <coughs> cool. So, cast this to a list. It gets evaluated. And now we can do this to our heart's content. We've only made one <coughs> query. But we've made a much larger query, right? And that is important to note, right? Like, if we only really wanted uh, every 100th uh, index, Maybe we didn't want to evaluate this whole thing. Maybe it would be cheaper. It just depends upon our, our data size. Yeah, it, it, on, the, uh, on the prior slide, in comparing it to this, does it actually run the query, <coughs> or is deal just now a definition of what a query will be when you run it, and that's why it runs it three times? Yeah, deals is a, is a query set. So a query set is in essence, a definition of what could be evaluated to a query. Right. And the evaluation step happens, what, in here, right? So it, it knows, or maybe it's even, you know, I actually don't know this. Uh, no, sorry, I didn't do this test. So the, this actually has the evaluation done in here, but it also adds, so it does sort of two things. It says, all right, give me the first element only to my SQL, and then it evaluates it. So it kind of combines two steps at once. Right, and that's why when on the next slide, when you do the work, <coughs> you're actually running it to store it, and that's why you have to do it once. Right. All right, next thing. Beware of queries and loops. Uh, you don't want to loop over the same query over and over. That can become a very painful way to access your database.
Instead, you can reduce your queries with things like select related. So this is a fairly simple goal here, right? I just want to go through all my ops and print out the name, the value, and what the stage is. The stage is another object, another model. So I just want to select that and get it all now. Simple join. This is fairly straightforward. It's not rocket science, but it's something you want to consider. Uh, whenever you put in a query set evaluation in a loop, ask yourself, is that really what I want to be doing? Or will my database come back to haunt me? Uh, do be careful, though. And, and I apologize. This is the only non-Futurama image in here. But I couldn't find anything else better for biting you. you know? So if you select related, uh, obviously models can become pretty big, have a lot of relationships. Uh, select related by default will just load up pretty much every relation you have. You don't necessarily want to do that as well. Again, your enemies are data and complexity. You don't want to join in more data and more tables than you have to. So do these things um, on purpose, not as a matter of course. All right, so going to a little bit more complex, uh, we've got leads and we want to filter by the campaign name that starts with Python. And I have, uh, I don't have a list of this out here, but there's three campaigns. There's Python 2010, 2011, 2012 in my campaign list of 25. And so this is how you're going to do that, that filter. I put the explain here. This actually becomes uh, fairly slow when you get to a million leads with anywhere between one and five connections to, uh, to 25 different campaigns. And one of the first things I always do, I say, okay, this is slow. Let's go to MySQL or the Django debug toolbar and let's explain it. Let's look at what MySQL is doing to break this down. And one of the things that looks out to me is that we're using a where clause here. There's no possible keys, so there's nothing that MySQL has sort of pre-built to help it evaluate this query. So one of the things you can do besides adding single column uh, indexes is add multiple column indexes using the, the meta class in the model and then using the index together. You can have any, any number. Um, I don't have the time or even a, not fresh enough to give a talk on choosing your right MySQL index, but that's a whole other talk. Uh, when in doubt, experimentation is good. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff online about how to choose your indexes for queries. Uh, I would say you generally want to encounter your problem first and analyze it in MySQL. Uh, you can just use the MySQL console to test things out. I do it all the time. Most of what I do. So, using South, do a schema migration, build the index. And now coming back to explain, now we have this part is taking care of the where, it's using this index. Uh, this actually had negligible benefit when I did it. Uh, it's called a bad example. Sorry. Yeah. Does it use the index under the hood? Like, it just knows that you have an index, there's no mapping anywhere else that you have to set up? MySQL does. MySQL is incredibly intelligent when it so, comes to so breaking down the query. So hands off to MySQL and it knows what to do? Yep. Doing... Yeah, the, um, the Django query doesn't do anything differently when it decides, when it, when it asks MySQL, give me this data with these joins. You can do index hints or forces. You can, you can try and tell MySQL specifically what to do. It's not something that uh, I would generally recommend. It's not generally necessary. And it's not something that I know. I don't know anyone who considers that best practices. You can do it, though. I do it sometimes for testing when I want to create like four indexes and just test to see. And if you do that, you have to do, um, you have to use like an extra uh, build around the Django query set to, to put in some raw SQL into your query set. And does this thing apply for, I guess, model definitions? Like you put the index equals true or look at the syntax. So that's all you have to do for an index. You don't need to do anything else down the 
you have to add it, and then you have to do the migration step, right? So, uh, MySQL an index is is a, basically a column that MySQL maintains based upon the other columns in the system, and it does have some negative effects. For instance, uh, it can slow down your insertion into your table, and it obviously will increase your size because, in, for instance, in my ISAM tables, uh, the the index is actually a whole other file, and you can see those things get larger. Um, you want to adjust your settings to make sure you, your indexes can fit in memory, and uh, I didn't get to this, I should have, I, I meant to put this in the talk, but uh, your, the length of your column, it's very common to have a, a, a bar char that's 255 characters. Uh, there are maximum lengths to indexes, so you have to be careful about doing that. You can actually get some ridiculously good speed improvements just by reducing your bar charts to things that are more reasonable. Cool. So yeah, uh, I apologize for this very uninspiring graph. I had a limited amount of time, three months, to come up with a good, uh, <laughs> a good example, and uh, couldn't. Couldn't in that time span. I don't really have a very good excuse. Sorry, uh, but indexes are key. That's how you do multi-column indexes in Jacob. So another scenario. This is something that I ran into at Inside Square, and this took a lot of time to figure out what to do. Um, but suppose we have a very complex query set, and by very complex, I mean it's got multiple joints, multiple where clauses, maybe a group by, and Let's assume that this is as optimized as far as it can go. So there's nothing we can do inside there. And on top of that, we need to use this to get deals. So we don't want to rewrite it because we don't really know it, we don't understand it. It was passed to us from a higher level part or lower level part of the application. And we want to use this to filter all of the deals that we're going to go through. We're also going to do other things. So this is going to become a very complex query. So what you can do, as was mentioned, the recombination of query sets, you can uh, use this in back. So the lead is has a relationship, the opportunity has a relationship to the lead. And you say opportunity lead in your very complex leads query set. And this will actually write out in MySQL as lead ID in parentheses select ID, whatever that would evaluate to as a select statement. This becomes a subquery in this very large complex select statement, which can be great. And oftentimes, that can actually provide you with a lot of speed improvement just by using the ability to use these things as subqueries. But the sad truth is that there does come a point at which MySQL can't handle the number of where clauses, the number of group bys, the number of subqueries that you throw at it. So one possible solution is to go back to our evaluation step and say, all right, there's definitely a parenthesis here that is missing. Um, go back to our solution of controlling when we evaluate query sets and say, all right, I want to get this whole list. This is very complex. It's going to take four tenths of a second or 40 seconds, whatever our data size is, right? Whatever our threshold for pain is. And we're going to evaluate to a list of IDs, and then I'm going to send that through so that it doesn't have to reevaluate that. The problem is, this can also suck. Uh, if this list, and this I have a, a sort of a threshold for, uh, this list about 500, 1,000 um, IDs long, you don't start to feel too much pain. When you get anywhere above that 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 IDs, just the size of the query when you have to like so you're basically doing, right? You're doing lead ID in, and then in your MySQL query, you're putting in hundreds of thousands of numbers. So your query that you're that you transmitting to MySQL is megabytes. And we saw this. That's not good either, right? It's, it's not built to do that. MySQL doesn't have an intelligent way to handle that. And Django also, as it turns out, doesn't handle it well, even on sort of the basic putting numbers back and forth. So I brought this up earlier that the uh, 
Django, you know, calling pool and actually evaluating the need object at all was in line with the size. But it's not in line with MySQL. It's actually much slower than MySQL. How do I have a, uh, anyhow, sorry about that hover thing there. I think that's permanent. <coughs> Yeah. Anyhow, so, so here I mapped on leads at object at all how long the query set took in Django, and then how long that query actually took in MySQL. And as you can see, Django and MySQL they start out I mean virtually the same amount of time, and then Django just starts to take off as the size of the data gets larger. And that's pretty much the problem I was describing before: is when you're dealing with large sets of of integers or large sets of data, if you're trying to send them back and they're getting them from MySQL and send them back, uh, Django just doesn't have a good style to, to, to really deal with that. It's memory management stuff, it's internals. Uh, I haven't taken a deep dive to figure out what exactly is causing that, but I can tell you um, it's not good. And the other thing is MySQL itself, if it gets to that list of 100,000, you know, seemingly random IDs, it doesn't really have anything intelligent to do. It can't optimize the query with all of its intelligent database computer science ideas. It's just a list of 100,000 random IDs. Is everybody with me so far? This is the deepest part of the talk. All right, so I really like this image, so I had to find the right language. So maybe there's something in here that we can use. Because right now I kind of feel like we're damned if we do, damned if we don't, right? We're damned if we act, ask MySQL to build this very complex query for us and give us the results we want. But we're also damned if we sort of try and slice it in half and say, Eric, give us this part and then we'll send it back to you. Uh, that's not good either. So maybe there is some sort of crazy scientist idea here. And this is the code that I built off that idea. The idea here is that we want to evaluate the query in pieces because MySQL can't combine them and evaluate it efficiently. But we don't want to bring all of those IDs all the way out to the Django layer and send them all the way back. So what we want to do is sort of tempify the query set. We want to run that extremely complex lead query set in MySQL take all those IDs, put them in a temporary table, and then build a temporary Django model that will just point to that table. Oh, and we'll have a primary key index on that one column of IDs. And then we're going to pass that query set back up to Django. It's still lazily evaluated, so it, the data itself isn't at the Django layer. And then it can be recombined. So I'm not going to run through this code line by line because beer, uh, but that's basically the approach, is you want to create an actual temporary um, Django model that you can build query sets from that can be, that can behave as a normal query set. But you want to actually evaluate it sort of in the middle. So this is, it's, it's, it's sort of like if, you know, there's lazy evaluation and there's like immediate evaluation. This is like jogging. Right? Uh, we're going to sort of do it half-heartedly. And we're going to leave the data, the intermediate step data, at MySQL's layer and let it handle it from there. We can still relate to it. We can call it if we really want to, but we don't. So benefits are you calculate the IDs. You store no cost to transfer. The temporary table is fully indexed. It's very fast. The, the overhead of actually doing this whole step, even though it kind of sounds wiggy, is not very high, because this is the kind of thing that MySQL does internally all the time anyhow. And this temp query set is still a fully fledged query set with all of the different functionality you would like. Uh, the asterisk here is, it, it's not, even if it were sort of a temp query set of leads, they're no longer leads. They don't have all the other data, they're just IDs. So it is a query set, but it's not the model it once was. How did you guys figure out that this was the right strategy at Inside Square? Um, I hid in a corner till I was done. <laughs> uh, we have uh, a lot of, so we have a particular library 
that we've written that calculates um, a lot of life cycle issues, like when did an opportunity or a lead or a deal go through a certain stage? Did it go backwards? Um, what activities were correlated with that? Uh, the model that I showed, the, the ORM in is um, probably about five or six times more complicated than the one I showed. I, I just built one from memory that was simpler. But um, there's a lot of elements in there and a lot of complexity, a lot of business logic that probably nobody can fully explain. So it's, it's somewhat sensitive code with a lot of um, interesting rules to it. We didn't want to break it down and undo it. We wanted to pick a particular intermediate step and let it no longer be a problem. And what happened was, uh, Insight Square's analytics package has a lot of really good filtering functionality, right? But at some point, these things, when you start using them in conjunction, they go from a linear uh, increase of, of complexity and linear um, increase in time it takes to run a query to exponential. And so what we found is that if we found some interesting sort of junctures at which we could evaluate it, simplify the query, handle, and then hand that through to MySQL to do more complex things again, but then you know, building off of something that was now simple, uh, we didn't run into that exponential growth curve of complexity leading to long running queries. But I spent, I mean, I spent three or four months doing nothing but trying to find ways to make things faster. And this was certainly the craziest thing I came up with. But it, it certainly wasn't, um, I mean, even this was not foolproof. Like, there were a lot of things that this didn't work as well for. But it, in some situations, it worked extremely well. So that um, the temp query set variable kind of is a whatever the whatever the temporary object is, not objects at all. Is that, is that fair to say? Yep. It's everything in that temp. So is it, is it going to get flushed after this? Oh, yeah. That's a good point. The way this is written, uh, temporary tables, something like that. So, uh, so temporary tables in MySQL are in memory, which is good. Uh, they are, they only live for the lifespan of this connection, of, the, of this session with, with the server. So that was actually, there's some really tricky stuff in. I'll be happy to send this code to anyone. I can't guarantee it'll work because I had to recreate it, but uh, I can certainly go through it. Uh, at some other time. So you have to do some pretty crazy things, like you have to set the, um, you have to actually access the original query sets query compiler, which is a fairly internal structure that no one should ever use <laughs> unless you're feeling, you know, masochistic. So you also have to reuse the cursor. I found that if I try to create a new uh, database cursor. I ran into a problem, like create a new connection and get a cursor to that database connection. I didn't wind up getting tied into the same session, and I couldn't access the temporary table uh, when I reused this whole thing later, right? So it would it would create this temporary table on this new cursor that I created, but then if I reused that with a different query set that had the old cursor and the old database connection, it wouldn't see the temporary table. Hey Ben, um, all bets are off at, with Postgres, right? You have to do this differently if you were using Postgres. I don't know. Okay. I mean, I think that you know anything I say after this is going to be wrong. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, I'm stopping. <laughs> Maybe. I'd love to see it. I'd, I'd love to actually turn this into a little open source library. If anyone wants to help me do that. Um, I think that would be pretty cool for this thing. So. Anyhow, um, that's my talk. <laughs> it's not comprehensive. There's a thousand other things that uh, someone who were an expert in this would have put in. Um, but that's, that's what I came up with. Thank you all for coming. And um, this is the last future on image I found. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey, sorry, what's your name? I, I should have been asking this before. Everyone tell me their name if they're going to ask a question. Uh, name's Rich. Rich. At what point does it make sense just to go to Ross SQL? I was thinking about that as you're going through your last. To go to Ross SQL? Yeah. Rather Practically than... never, because as soon as you go to Ross SQL, you lose all of that um, power of the query set library, which is a phenomenal library. Mm -hmm. It has a phenomenal algebra, phenomenal algebra for combining things and reusing them. Um, so, I mean, I. As you can imagine, looking at that code, I fought tooth and nail not to go to Ross SQL. Yeah, so. What's your name again? Uh, Shekhar. Shekhar. Uh, you also lose portability if you decide to switch uh, backends. Yeah. This library is not without its risks, right? And, um, well, if you did the Ross SQL, you lose that. If you do this thing, you lose that, unless someone builds this into an open source library that supports multiple backends. Joe, um, and one of the places that I've found that I've actually used Ross SQL is the data migrations, simply because iterating all the objects and trying to you know, uh, procedurally put all the stuff together when I know I can write uh, an ugly looking but sub-second SQL query for totally. these updates. Migrations uh, it's a one-time one thing. Just do it. I, I, I had some, some, um, some younger engineers on my team. Come to, one guy kept coming to me about, is this migration fast enough? I said, what? I, I don't even care. Like, it's going to be run once. And it's done. Yeah, but I've, I've had things that would time out, but would be sub-second in MySQL, and you embed it in the actual, you can, you can within, if you south for migrations, do a data migration in your Ross SQL in there. It'll uh, handle it just like it was a standard ORM call. Yeah, um, I used, all these tables were in my ISAM and inside squared, uh, because there's a very particular way that the data is generated. It's actually written all at once and then pushed out to production server and then written again and replaced. Um, so my SAM was much better for than the NODB for that. Uh, obviously, if you're writing to this data, you probably want to be using NODB and you have a lot more safety issues. Um, NODB is going to maintain some relationship integrity for you. It's also going to be a pain in the ass if you try and blow away all your data and create new test data like I was doing a lot. So. Cool. Everyone ready for beer? Matt? No, no, no. Before we do oh, beer. What? Matt? Did, you, did Matt have a question? Uh, uh, James, actually. Uh, what? Sorry, James. No worries. Okay, uh, so, not as much a question as a comment. Uh, I was just going to note that like, some queries often get a really bad wrap, and that's because they often have really horrible performance. But your versions of MySQL have actually like, internally optimized them, so they'll get rewritten into more efficient queries. So, like, if you've used them before and had a bad experience, it would be worth giving them another shot because of that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I can't say it any better than that. Oh, yeah. Agreed. Thanks very much. Well, cool. Well, everybody give Ben a hand. And, uh, <laughs> so, and we also have a second t-shirt to give out this evening for uh, Chris who has done a phenomenal job of videoing all of the presentations this year, and that has been awesome. So thank you, Chris. Cool. So beer. <laughs>